Hello, and welcome to the FDR Presidential Library. I'm Bill Harris, the acting director here, and today we wanted to talk about Hollywood. Now, that sounds like a lot of fun, and it sounds like it could be very light, and it is. There's some really interesting things in our collection because the president was very much engaged with the entertainment industry. He knew, he was savvy enough to know that his message could be uh, promoted even more broadly by people who are exceptionally popular across the country. Now, one example of this is the um, correspondence he had with Clark Gable and uh, Gable's wife, Carol Lombard. Uh, this it perfectly demonstrates how the president interacted, and it also demonstrates the opposite side of this story that takes it beyond just entertainment and fun, but also takes it into the serious business of how the motion pictures could benefit the president and how sometimes that could lead to tragedy. The first folder is, again, from Clark Gable and Carol Lombard, and it really does begin with um, an exchange about uh, them attending a speech by the president. But then after Pearl Harbor, it moves into something much more serious. What we have are the Gables asking and volunteering for service to the president. They want to be able to help in the war effort. The president is very polite and very appreciative, actually, and writes back, thanking them, but that their service could be particularly beneficial both in the motion picture industry and in supporting the war cause through that. Unfortunately, shortly after the war began, Carol Lombard began to sell war bonds. And early in the war, in January of 1942, on a war bond trip, she um, was in a plane crash that killed her and her mother. Um, the president wrote a very heartfelt telegram to Clark Gable saying in particular, Carol was our friend, our guest in happier times. And the, Clark Gable then wrote back to the president, he was distraught and would remain so, uh, that the expression of that, um, of that sympathy from the president during the early years of the war was particularly touching to him. Another example of the president interacting with Hollywood stars is during the 1944 general election. Orson Welles, who was a noted um, producer, director, general genius, at the very least he thought so, but so many critics today, uh, volunteered to assist the president with his campaign effort. Now, Welles had a wide-ranging and very distinct personality, as well as a very mellifluous voice. Uh, he had gained fame initially uh, in the mid-30s with the Federal Theater Project, actually, where he had done a groundbreaking all-black production of Macbeth. He had also done, many of you may remember too, the famous War of the Worlds broadcast that did send some panic through some people in the state of New Jersey when it was broadcast. Now, in 1944, though, he was seriously dedicated to helping the president's cause and speaking around the country and on the radio. He even went on to a broadcast with Dewey and argued for Roosevelt. In particular, in this document that we see here, Wells is writing the president, thanking him for offering him a good um, health because Wells had been ill and had been unable to uh, be on the campaign trail. He had returned home to his wife, Rita Hayworth, where he had recovered. And writing to the president, October 25th, 1944, the uh, Orson Wells says, Mr. President, this illness was the blackest of misfortunes for me because it stole away so many days from the campaign. That's just an example of this working relationship that Wells had. Wells took it seriously, and certainly the president did in 1944. He wanted those messages um, carried to the broadest possible um, audience, and Wells, uh, who was known to uh, not only be very supportive, but also to be very um, interested in his own future and was considering maybe a political career, saw this also as an opportunity for himself. It is important to remember also that the motion picture industry was an industry and a major contributor to the economy of the United States. And so when the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, the leading industry uh, um, group of technicians and actors, uh, wanted the president to speak at their annual Oscar ceremony, the president eagerly agreed. Now, this request occurred in February, um, or in January, actually, and the ceremonies were in February. A radio line was set up to the ceremony so the president could give essentially closed-circuit radio remarks to the Academy at the ceremony. After the Academy, he received many telegrams and letters from Hollywood 
personalities. One, just to give you an example, is from David O. Selznick, the producer of Gone with the Wind and many other uh, very successful motion pictures, who had also worked at RKO and MGM and was just generally noted as a showman in Hollywood. So here he uh, thanks the president for his address and the president uh, had made a good impact on the, mo on the motion picture industry during the ceremony, and uh, the industry continued to be really very supportive of the president throughout the 1941. Though the motion picture industry was um, particularly supportive of the president and the cause of the war during, uh, from 41 to 1945, the Warner Brothers were especially supportive of the president, beginning long before the war, during the president's first administration especially. They were supporters of the NRA, surprisingly, and they took a, a, a real um, approach to the common man. And uh, they wrote extensively to the president, um, voicing their support, as well as providing motion pictures to the president to view in the White House, as well as to find out if there were ways uh, in which the motion picture industry could also, or at least their studio, support some of the more controversial um, issues of the day, including uh, before World War II, the realization of the fascist threat in Europe. Now, in our collection, uh, we have a rather uh, larger folder of uh, letters to and from uh, the White House, and primarily Jack Warner, but also his brother Harry. Um, some particularly interesting ones include, uh, well, his 1941 pass to all Warner Brothers theaters, uh, which, uh, you know, the president was not going to the movies. He generally viewed them in the White House, but annually uh, the Warners would send him a pass just in case he wanted to go, go out to the movies. Also, we have, um, before the war commenced, the Warners were actively supporting the Allied cause in Europe. They were concerned greatly about Great Britain succumbing to the Nazis, and they had seen the Nazi threat as Jewish immigrants long before others did, and worked actively as a studio to point out that risk, especially with a film in 1939 called Confessions of a Nazi Spy, which essentially cost them the very lucrative German market. Now, um, this letter from 1941, from September, uh, Jack Horner is pointing out that they have purchased two Spitfire airplanes for the British war cause. They also supported um, the manufacture of a ship for that cause. The president, of course, uh, fondly replies. Another good example of their communications back and forth is the Warners always offering prints of their films, especially during the war when they dealt with patriotic subjects. This didn't always sit well with the president, not because he didn't enjoy motion pictures, the president very much did, but because obviously he's leading America's war effort and uh, against the um, fascists. Uh, so the president um, notes in a, a letter, a memo actually, to one of his aides, uh, in quotes from the aide, will you tell Jack Warner there isn't a prayer of my going to the movies until 1945? And this was in 1942, so that's quite prescient that the president was anticipating perhaps 1945, which turned out to be the end of the war, as the next time he would be able to see a motion picture uh, in the White House. So these are just a few examples of actually the copious correspondence between the Warners, particularly Jack, um, and the president, both before and during World War II. Another really good cause that the president supported and that Hollywood definitely participated in was his annual birthday balls. Now, these were fun events in Washington. Uh, frequently, they were broadcast over the radio, and the president would listen uh, eagerly from the White House while Mrs. Roosevelt attended, often at the Mayfair Hotel on Connecticut Avenue, the birthday celebration and cut the cake. Now, these weren't just for fun. They were to support the March of Dimes, uh, which was seeking a cure for polio. And of course, the president was was deeply and personally concerned about this cause. Uh, there would usually be a lunch or um, a luncheon during the day in which hosts quite an array of Hollywood celebrities of the time from all the different studios would come for the luncheon. Here we have a guest list for Thursday afternoon, January 30th in 1941. And the list is, I mean, it could be the Academy Awards. There's so many people here, including uh, Glenn Ford 
and Maureen O'Hara. Uh, many of you may know her from John Wayne Films, as well as the original Parent Trap. And Lana Turner, George Raft, and even the musician Benny Goodman, who would perform at the birthday celebrations, which were also co-located often at New York nightclubs or in places in California, and there would be cuts around to them for the radio broadcasts. And all of this both honored the president for his support for the cause, but really also was meant to drive donations and to bring awareness to the cause of fighting polio. Thank you for being with us today. As you can see, topics that can be fun and that show a really light side of our collection can also evidence very serious topics and also the president's ability to connect uh, and recognize that the entertainment industry itself could be key to helping advance his causes. Uh, so join us again uh, for our programs, and be sure to check out our offerings on uh, fdrlibrary.org and on archives.gov.